Hi, how's it going? So I am 100% done talking about bullies, internet trolls and psychos, and reprobate individuals. Because I have found out just by how they behave that they don't want to even help themselves so i'm not going to bother wasting my, my i'm not going to bother wasting my time trying to help them i will however be helping people get through spiritual warfare though so basically everything that i said i stand by what these people are doing it's just self-hatred, narcissism, jealousy and envy, and that's all it is. So if you are feeling attacked by people, just understand that it is only to do with them and nothing to do with you. And I also spoke in the last video about people to be extremely careful of okay i used that lady from the detox intuitive channel andrea cox and even still today uh, after everything that she's done she still thinks that i'm stupid and is still trying to get into my good graces to make it to try and make me believe that she has my best interests at heart which I know that she doesn't because, um, yeah, she was one of the morons that was targeting me when I went into the city earlier today. So yeah, as I said, wolf in sheep's clothing. These are just people that you need out of your energy. Period. As I said, they're beyond help and they are reprobate, so just don't even pay them any mind. So what happened this morning was, is that my power got cut completely by these people. But instead of it only being my apartment that had a power outage, it was like the entire area so they wouldn't so they I don't know guess assume that I wouldn't know that I'm being targeted again I guess but I know everything cuz I'm the keeper of keys so my cuz the my like all my electricity went out my hot water system is powered by electricity it's, not powered by gas so i ended up having a freezing cold shower i beg your pardon there are police sirens going off in the background once again yes so i ended up having a freezing cold shower this morning and it's the middle of winter and I did not like that at all because I like having steaming hot showers so what I did was when I went into the shower I turned on the hot water started <laughs> police sirens I'm gonna get through this though So I turned on the hot water and I started wetting my hair, getting ready to shampoo it and started wetting the, the, west, the rest of my body. And then the water just went completely cold. So I turned it off. Then I put the shampoo in my hair and because there was water all over my body, I just soaked up the rest of my body. And then I rinsed everything off with freezing cold water and it was so difficult to do. Then 
Okay, for me, when it's really, really cold, my back just starts to ache. So I had to do it a few times. I had to get out of the shower, <laughs> stand in the sunlight, go back into the shower, rinse my hair, went back out, stood in the sunlight, warmed my body up a little bit, jumped back, rinsed my shampoo out with freezing cold water. Oh, and then my scalp started aching as well because of the cold water. And it actually made me think. This actually made me think. This actually happens around the world with people that are living in poverty that don't have the luxury of hot water like I have. They don't even have the bare necessities of life, let alone the luxury of hot water. So we're actually going to talk about poverty. That is extremely important. It is first world problem. What is poverty? We all know what poverty is. According to my dictionary app, the state of being poor, lack of the means of providing material needs or comforts, deficiency in amount, unproductiveness, infertility, renunciation made by a member of a religious order of the right to own a property. The condition of being without adequate food, money, etc. Scarcity or dearth. A lack of elements conductive, conductive to, to fertility in land or soil. The state of condition of having little or no money, goods or means of support. Condition of being poor. Deficiency of necessity necessary or desirable ingredients, qualities, etc., and insufficiency. And as we all know, it is such a big problem in the world. So I've already made a video talking about this, but YouTube won't let me upload it because I was playing music throughout the video. So I'm going to do this again. I'm going to do this with the help from someone that I personally look up to, Michael Tellinger. He is a very, very intelligent man. He's an archaeologist. I don't know if he's spiritual. I know he's religious. I know that he's a Christian or Catholic. And above all, he is a human being that cares about other human beings. So I guess what I wanted to know at first was how did it actually get so bad? How it got so bad actually is a small group of royal political families and banking elite families took control of the world. Started with Sumerians 6,000 years ago in the Middle East, Sumeria. When the kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven, priest king suddenly appeared and took control of the world as we know it. I hope Michael doesn't sue me for putting this, but I'll put the entire workshop in. I'll put the link for this workshop in the description down below. And he can back absolutely everything that he says up himself because he is an archaeologist he has discovered ancient artifacts to give us a better understanding of how the world actually got to the state that it's in so what happens next after that i'll tell you what happens next when people settle down because those police sirens are disturbing me. I know that the police are only doing their job, but, you know, we are dealing with uh, reprobate people.
and you people are a big problem. So what happened next is money was created. Money was ma maliciously introduced as a tool of enslavement. Money did not evolve out of barter and trade. I'm really, really bad with technology, so I actually can't put the video on my screen. And I've got like bad sound quality on my computer, but this will have to do. Money is not part of natural evolution. This is a complete misunderstanding of human history. Anyone that teaches you that has not done their homework. Money was maliciously introduced in ancient times as a tool of enslavement, the absolute tool of enslavement, and we are feeling the worst brunt of it right now. We are the guys, we are the civilization, we are the, the people on, in the history of this planet right now that can make a change. It's up to us what we do with this information and how we move from here forward. Today, there are three main banking families. There are arguably a few more, but the big ones, obviously, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Morgans, they control everything. They own all the banks in the world. How can I make the statement? Because they're the guys that bail out the banks when they go under. So they own them. It's simple, right? If you bail somebody out, you're going to own them. And you're not going to bail something out that you don't own, or at least that you don't control. So the World Bank, the IMF, the BI, the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, Switzerland, most people aren't even aware that there's a thing called the Bank of International Settlement. When they discover this, they, what? Wow, that's amazing. I hope they're good people. <laughs> Can't they give us a loan? <laughs> Remember, people, money doesn't exist. Okay, I'm going to get into this. Uh, yes, did you want to say? Yes, uh, what I'm going to understand is, you now say all the past history was rubbish and it was all evil, but still you want to run for government, for president. I don't understand it. So okay. You believe in the system, but mm -hmm. everything else was rubbish. No, 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 I don't, no, no. Okay, so no, 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 you, you're getting the wrong end of the stick. We, we, we created the, yes, you are. We created the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. I'm going through it now. Just hold, hold on, you'll understand where I'm going with this. Okay. okay. time we finish here. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Uh, the banking families own the world. Simple as that. If you don't believe that, then you also haven't done your homework. So all the discussions we've been having, and I've been going into many of these discussions, money keeps coming up all the time. But remember, money doesn't exist. Money is just empty promises. It, there is no thing as money. In fact, uh, for those of you that know, I've been I've been actively involved in legal cases in South Africa against the banks, not just the banks, against the Central Bank, the South African Reserve Bank, the Minister of Finance as well. I've even opened up a constitutional court case against the banks, the Minister of Finance and the Reserve Bank, uh, which had an interesting ending. If we have time, we can talk about that, but uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, two years ago, myself and a small group of other people, mostly Scott Cundall, started uh, asking the banks certain questions. And, um, and we couldn't get answers out of them. And then we started doing research and realizing how it all works. And for the fractional reserve system, you all know that, or you should know that. And the fact that money doesn't exist. In fact, in the South African Bank Act, to my horror of horrors, and I was in court, and I was doing research to stand up and defend myself, because the only way we can do this is to, when you stand up in court and defend yourself. So we didn't use lawyers. I went there and I stood and defended myself against the, the most you know, highest paid lawyers money can buy. And not just one of them, I was alone in the court against the judge that you have to call my lord and bow down when you walk into the court, my lord. And you start realizing the cabal ritualistic club that these people belong to. It's spectacular. We're black robes. 
And you go to go there and call it, my lord, my lord. I, you know, I thought I was going to cause trouble at first, but then I bit my tongue and I didn't do that. <laughs> and, and, but what I found is that in the Bank Act in South Africa, and I'm sure the same goes for, for the rest of the world, there is no definition for the word money. There is, however, a definition for bills of exchange, promissory notes, and negotiable instruments. And I realized the banks don't work with money. The banks work with promissory notes, bills of exchange, and negotiable instrument. And, and those are called liquid because they have value. They are the liquid, ne valuable instruments, negotiable instruments, that banks work with behind the scenes. And this becomes really exciting and interesting. So we started realizing we could create promissory notes and bills of exchange and liquid negotiable instruments as soon as they have our signature on it. And we started doing some of this, just causing trouble. Anyway, it didn't get us very far because the judges didn't understand this at all. They thought we were, we're just causing trouble with the courts. But nevertheless, what we managed to do in the three Supreme Court cases that I defended myself against these banksters, we managed to get very important things out of the lawyers or the bankers. They admitted to everything we accused them of. We accused them of breaking the, bank, the, the contract law because they don't have what they pretend to loan. They don't have the money. Remember, in contract law, you need, you can't lend something that you do not possess. So when, that was one of our arguments. So we said, well, the banks aren't actually banks because they don't own any money. And they admitted, yes, no, we don't own any money. So, okay, great. Judge, did you get that? And, um, and then we said, well, that means that you're an agent and you're not a banker. So you can't charge interest and you can't come after me because the contract is null and void. And then we realized that they securitize your signature. They sell every document you have, every document you sign with your signature on it and has a value on it is sold into, in a process called securitization. And uh, this is a global industry. Global banking industry works with securitization. And they're very proud of it. They publish the securitization information on their websites. But then when you argue securitization in court, they deny it. They say, no, we don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. no? And the judges don't go and do their homework because the judges are so blinded by the banks and the lawyers, they just follow. They just can't imagine that the banks could be lying. So they, they agree that they practice securitization. Well, first of all, they, they, they denied that, that there is anything called securitization. They accused us of being fanciful and, and making things up and um, that they didn't have money to lend. We accuse them of not having locus standi or any rights to start the action against you because they sell your documents and your contract to a third party called a special purpose vehicle. And that special purpose vehicle company is a third party that takes complete ownership of your property, your car, your credit card debt, your overdraft. Everything is securitized by the banks because they don't have money. That's how they make money for themselves. It's all shuffling paper and bookkeeping entries and selling empty promises. And this is how junk bonds are created, because once you haven't paid on your bond, three months after you haven't paid on your home loan, your bond, uh, that goes stale. The, what does the, secure, the SBV uh, does, they then claim insurance on it, and they, they file it. So the SBV gets paid, the bank has been paid the moment they sell your signature to them. Everyone's been paid, but you keep paying for your home loan for the next 30 years. The moment you stop paying, the bank comes after you, says you owe us money, there's a contract, my lord. See, he signed a contract, he owes us money. And the judge doesn't for one second say, well, hold on, let's look at the validity of this contract. Do you have rights to this contract? Who owns the property? So this has now been exposed. We are this close in South Africa. Myself and Scott Cundell from New Economics Rights Alliance, we're this close from bringing down the banks. Yes. This close. Yes. So, yes. Because they're just lying thieves. What you're talking, what you're talking about, the global bank... If you missed that, he said that he and the team of people that he works with are this close... Maybe like even like a little bit more like that close to bringing down all the banks in South Africa. Yes, that's why everyone's clapping. King industry people is nothing more than the largest legalized organized crime syndicate. That's what it is. So they're a bunch of criminals. We've got to do something about it to stop it. So I've got a, yes. I've got a, I've got two cases against the banks now. One of five counts of fraud. And he said that the banks are criminals. 
And we have to do something to stop it. Uh, which they don't. They haven't argued any of the points. They've argued why I'm, why I'm claiming all the money <laughs> that I'm claiming. They're not arguing any of the points. And Scott Cundall has got a case with New Economics Rights Alliance, which has become the third largest non-profit organization in South Africa in the last six months, about 160,000 members. Um, he's, he's launched a case of, of unconstitutionality against all the banks. We're about to launch criminal charges against the banks, full-blown criminal charges, because the evidence is just becoming overwhelming. And all it's going to take now, one judgment... If there are any mathematicians here, you can see the complete insaneness of this. Out of thousands and thousands and thousands of court cases, people against banks, not one person has ever won a case against the banks. Just think about that. Clearly, this is stacked in favor of the banks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Clearly. And the judges are either paid off or they're too stupid to understand what's going on. But things have changed. We have a few situations in South Africa. We've had small victories where the banks withdrew. This is how clever they are. They withdraw before they get a judgment or they abandon. So there isn't a precedent on the record. So you can't then go and argue the precedent. So they're very clever with this. But we're going to force them into a judgment because of what we're doing. And um, it's just going to take that first judgment and then it's all over. The entire global banking system works on the same principles, and it's just going to be a domino effect. And we'll do what Iceland did, hopefully, just reverse all the mortgage loans, reverse all the car loans, credit card, just, you know, just reverse everything. Because these thugs have stolen trillions from us and make us their slaves. And that's exactly what they do. And this is linked to our education system, because most people are indoctrinated into this way of thinking since childhood. Um, this is our education system has nothing to do with learning. It's it's really developed and funded by the banking families. Um, so that's exactly how everything got so bad. Money was created, invented, whichever word you want to use, as a tool for power. And enslavement. Okay, so the poverty stricken countries are, and I'm so sorry because I know that I'm not going to be able to pronounce most of the names properly. I don't mean to offend anyone at all, but they are. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Uganda, Mozambique, Tanzania, Nigeria, Liberia, Chad, Madagascar. I thought that Madagascar was only the name of a children's film. <laughs> Even I learned something new today. Central African Republic, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, Mali, Guinea, Rwanda, Kenya, Togo, and Guinea, dash. It's spelled B I double S A U. I don't know how to pronounce that. What do all of those countries have in common with each other? Everyone that lives in those countries are dark skinned. And we all know what's happened to dark skinned people throughout history. Slavery. There's human trafficking and sex trafficking. That's separate to what we're talking about right now. That's also, like, another first world problem, too. Okay. Now we have Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a federal holiday in the, in the United States comm commemorating the emancipation of African-American slaves. It is also often observed for celebrating African-American culture. Originating in Texas, 
it has been celebrated annually annually on June 19th in various parts of the United States since 1865. Also called Juneteenth, National Independence Day, Black Independence Day, Jubilee Day, and in Texas it's known as Emancipa Emancipation Day. However, I beg to differ. As Michael Tellen just said, that money was created as a tool for power and enslavement. Africa is not a free country or it hasn't been set free from enslavement, from slavery at all. What I think, what I'm pretty sure is the case is when white people colonized Africa, they didn't find it. It was never lost. When they colonized it, they put dark skin, people of color into slavery. I don't know why. I know that it is effing disgusting because it is every single person's divine birthright to be treated as equal. So I think that when, because they were put into slavery, they were put into chains, put into boats, moved to America, treated like like there were nothing, being beaten incessantly, raped, the women who raped, tortured, like put to work. So they didn't have a chance to build an economy like how it is here in Australia. So eventually they were set free from slavery and they ended up borrowing money. These are the, just the third world countries. They ended up borrowing money from other countries like China, wherever. I think that's disgusting. I can't use curse words. That is absolutely disgusting. Because it couldn't have been terribly hard for them to have some compassion. And instead of le learning the money, they could have easily just given them the money without expecting it back in return. After what they had already been through. And knowing that they can't pay it back either. So these third world countries actually owe more interest than what they actually borrowed in the first place. Oh. From what I can remember, what I can vaguely remember, you know how contracts are all just word fuckery and confusing? Basically, in their contracts, it said that if you cannot afford to pay us back, we are going to take over your landmines. Sorry, not your landmines, your gold mines and your diamonds, cocoa. And basically own them completely. So I guess that whips and torture and, and chains 
have just been replaced by money. The whole of the African continent owes its public and private creditors $283 billion, but a large chunk of that, $119 billion, or 42%, has been lent to North African countries, including heavies like Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco. Okay, that was done on purpose. They knew, they knew that Africa could not afford to pay that back. They were put into, Africans were put into slavery. They couldn't build an economy. So that was done on purpose for power and control. Yeah, poverty is man-made. It's a man-made atrocity, actually. And the reason that I believe, okay, I am old and ugly enough to live within my truth. This is what I believe. This is what I choose to believe, is that I believe that was done on purpose. As I said, they knew they could not pay back the money that they had borrowed from other countries when they could have easily just given it to them out of compassion and love, kindness even. That was done on purpose because what, how can you, how can you justify slavery at all? You can't. Even saying sorry is not enough. So it's a form of, it's just another form of slavery and control really. It's like, okay, well, we've put them into slavery, so we're just going to put them into poverty now to make it look like they're the problem. They're a problem because they can't build their own economy, their own country. They've got to be dependent on, on everyone else. That's what I think. That's what I believe is the case. I watched... I watched the, the Hollywood movie Blood Diamonds, Blood Diamond with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Connelly, and in the opening scene is there are children that are harvesting, mining diamonds, and one boy, I don't know if he nicked it or if he just got accused of nicking a diamond, and then he got his hand cut off. See what I mean? Like, it hasn't changed. They've just replaced whips and chains and torture with money. And yeah, as I said, money to control them. I don't know how any of these creditors or these other countries can actually live with themselves knowing that there are babies, children, that are dying, I think 7 million children die a year from starvation. To me, that is unfathomable. How can you live with yourself? How can you go, how can you go to sleep at night knowing that you are actually responsible for human beings dying of starvation that don't have the bare necessities of life. I've seen on those World Vision ads, children bathing, drinking out of putrid water that hasn't been filtered, that has like manure in it. They don't have clean, they don't, they don't have clean water. They don't have health care. They don't have food. Like, the only thing that they have is world vision or people donating to them. That's all they have. So, in my books, that is... I can't swear, I can't curse. That is, like, effing criminal. That is criminal. Like... You actually are criminal for doing that.
that's essentially mass murder when you think about it. Purposely putting an entire nation into a situation like that. So Michael Tellinger is correct. The bank's creditors are actually thugs and criminals. So he said it is now up to us to find a solution. You know, where there's a will, there is a way. I've got a couple ideas. I have a couple of ideas. Um, so I guess for one, you know, Michael Tellinger is someone that I look up to. So I'm going to call him a mentor. Is he said that money is just created out of thin air? Well, it's not actually. It's created, like, made from cotton and linen and ink and other shit. But, yes, it is just created out of thin air. And it's just printed out of mint somewhere. So, I guess as a big ass apology and a gift, maybe start printing... 283 billion dollars there is no way in the world they will able to pay back that money it's going to accumulate it's going to get bigger the debt is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and that is a lot of money so i would get cracking like now I do not care how it's done that debt needs to be paid off like as soon as possible but also how can you put a price on a life you cannot put a price on a life it looks like China it's China is functioning just fine even with money that's owed to them or just to find some way I don't know if you can just find some way to void the contract it is not hard at all to have like some compassion for God's sake but Michael Tellinger did say that he is like really close to taking down all the banks just waiting for like that one judgment and he said that he's trying he said that he's really 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 trying to like get all that money like out those home loans those credit card debts etc like, I have currently bad, bad anxiety because of the stuff that's going on with me and the, Dem and the Dem Democratic Party. But I think that the American government are fuckheads and thugs and criminals. Yes, you are. That's what I think of you. I know because I looked this up myself. The average pay salary of a dark skinned person, person of color, is much lower than a white person's salary. And that is designed, that is purposely done because, well, of what the black community have endured throughout history. You don't want to, you do, you don't want to apologize 
Fair enough. Actually, no. Fuck you. That is unfair. That's disgusting. I need to keep my voice down because it's nearly midnight. That is disgusting. So, you are purposely not paying a person of colour the same that you would a white person because you want to make it seem like they're the thugs, they're the, there's something wrong with them. So then they have to resort to a life of crime, armed robberies, just, just to make ends meet. So if you don't want to apologize, if you don't want to apologize, make it right. Actions speak louder than words. Pay everyone, people of color, the same that you would a white person. Actions speak louder than words. And for god sake make it right with the third world countries get them out of debt so go to the mint print 283 billion dollars however much they owe creditors or void the contract as a gift and an apology and instead of pushing them further and further down um build them up so we're all equal how can anyone sleep at night really this is one of the many reasons the world is in such a low vibrational state i know how i feel when i see an ad on telly with world vision like showing us what children in Africa and other third, other third world countries like the Middle East are going through malnourished children with swollen bellies drinking filthy wa drinking filthy water I know exactly how I feel when I see that I feel helpless and I feel sad so do a lot of other people when they see that. I don't even, I don't know how true this is. I saw this on Instagram. I remember February, February. I can't pronounce some things properly. And from what I remember, February was Black History Month. And I remember seeing something that Joe Biden was making policemen guard dumpsters. So that specifically people of color couldn't even go to the, tr to the trash to get something to eat. I think that was purposely done to maybe to try and force them into criminal activities like robberies or stealing food from the grocery store just to make them think that they were thugs. If that's not true, then I'm sorry, but that's just a theory that I came up with. Well, that's what I choose to believe if that is actually true. So, Michael Tellinger. Oh, he's from South Africa, so he knows how bad it is there. Like, I used to have housemates that were South African, right? And they were just telling me, like, when they were children, how bad inflation was there. So, for example, like, I don't know, something would cost, like, three bucks one day, and then the next day it would cost, like, 50 bucks. And I actually got to the point where their family couldn't actually even afford a washing machine when it broke down, so they all just moved to Australia. And if you don't know what the Ubuntu movement is, I would recommend everyone that aren't like these reprobate 
morons to follow them on Instagram. I do, actually. And I can just remember I was having a very, very off day. It was after, it was like the day after my fentanyl suicide attempt. I felt really stupid actually the next day and I was I looked and I felt rough as guts and it just came up on my Instagram like a self-care checklist have you showered today have you brushed your teeth just simple stuff like that and so you know Michael Tellinger who is from South Africa is also an archaeologist gives a great example how to live in a world free of money and he starts off with a quote by Thomas Jefferson I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies if the, Amer if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency first inflation then by deflation the banks and all corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all poverty until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered the issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs i absolutely agree with that and this is by far the most cutting statement made in recent times, Thomas Jefferson, because this is what we find ourselves in today. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties and standing armies. Michael Tellin, yeah, he's South African, so his accent is a lot more. <laughs> uh, better, nicer sounding than mine is if the american people ever allow private banks remember all our banks in the world are virtu interesting <laughs> virtually all the banks are private banks private corporations whose interest is making profit at all cost so if the american people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency first by inflation then by deflation the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the the banks will drive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. That's where we are standing today. All over the world, this is the situation we're in. Money is the obstacle to all progress. It does nothing for society. It is the absolute tool of control by those that control the issue and the printing of money. That's why when I say they own the world, they do. They literally, physically own the world in each of one of our asses. Hey, so if you don't have a side hustle yet, but you can do it from anywhere, you need oh, to ads. It prevents the natural flow of free energy, and that is very important to this weekend's activities here. Money prevents the natural flow of free energy, so I beg you, everyone present here, remember it's about free energy, not I'm going to make a billion dollars out of this energy. Give it away for free. It'll come back to you in ways you cannot imagine. Do that one thing for humanity. If you find any source of free energy, don't try and make zillions out of it. It will kill you or they will kill you before you can get it out there. Money is the primary cause for the seven deadly sins. We all know the seven deadly sins or have we forgotten them already? The seven deadly sins? Gluttony, greed, envy, pride, lust, Wrath and sloth, sloth, sloth. It's not the love of money. Many people ask, oh, it's just the love of money. Money, nothing wrong with money, man. It's just a form of exchange. You know, we're so poisoned that we, we, try, and, we try and argue for, for it. We try and defend it. That's how poisoned our minds have become. It's incredible. It's not the love of money. It's the mere presence of money that causes all these problems. If you take money out of the system, all this stuff 
suddenly and miraculously vanishes. So what is the solution if it's the mere presence of money or the love of money of all of the above? What are we going to do to solve the problem? The answer is so blatantly obvious. Remove money. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. What do we need it for? It's causing all the strife in our lives. Exactly. It's destroying our planet. The mines are raping our Mother Earth, taking out the precious guts out of our Gaia and distributing it around the world to people that claim they own it. It's sick. The obvious questions, if you remove money, so who's going to shovel the crap? How are we going to pay for things? I'll just sit on my ass and do nothing. I want 50 Ferraris. You know, are we going back to the dark ages, living in caves? Is this a lawless society? Who's going to make the rules? Why should I do something I don't want? These are the first things. I know that these are the most commonly asked questions, and I'm sure that you're asking some of them to yourselves. But um, I can tell you that as you work through this process of a moneyless society, a Buntu society where everybody contributes their natural talents or acquired skills to the greatest benefit of all, with certain minor rules that are not rules it's really just an agreement that this is how we're going to work together the moment you start working in that kind of community the abundance is so spectacular that we right now cannot imagine it it is not possible for us to imagine it until you start immersing yourself in this kind of thinking and i call these the ubuntu communities as i said where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greater benefit of all in the community a new social structure for a new world and a new age abundance for all beyond our wildest belief there are five mantras five key points to the ubuntu society and it's not barter or trade everybody often jumps a lot of people jumps to the, to the conclusion think oh let's go back to barter no he who has more to barter or trade will eventually rule the roost so you can't go to that system if you have nothing to trade, what are you going to say? Well, I've got nothing to trade, so I'll have to, you know, kiss your butt. No. So, the Ubuntu contribution mantra is, the five points, no money, no barter, no trade, no value attached to anything greater or lesser than anything else. Because why? Each one of our contributions should be and is equally valuable. If you start telling, well, I'm a doctor, my time is more valuable than yours, you're barking up the wrong tree, brother. Okay. So... And the final one where everyone contributes for the greater benefit of all in the community because that is how you get rewarded. You get rewarded by the recognition of the people in your community. Isn't that the highest reward everybody wants and is trying to buy with money is recognition and respect of others? In essence, ultimately, that's what most people really want. It's just to be loved and recognized for what they've done. And they think they can use money to do that. And then when they make a lot, a lot of money, they get zillions in the bank. Then they suddenly realize, oh, well, nobody loves me anymore. They all want to take my money. So let me spend my money and then people will love me. And that's generally what happens when they start paying for things and people love them more. When they start giving it away. <laughs> so, united Ubuntu communities. In unity we thrive and anything is possible. Anything is possible. A world without money. There's no crime, no envy, no gluttony, no greed, no hoarding, no hierarchy. And the whole Ubuntu... The Ubuntu... Okay. A world without money. There is no crime, no envy, no gluttony, no greed, no, no hoarding, and most important, no hierarchy. No obstacles to any kind of progress. Movement and the Ubuntu party has no hierarchy. Communities look after themselves. We have no central government. Yep. We don't have any central assholes trying to tell you <laughs> how you should be running your life. No obstacles to any kind of progress. Because the solutions are simple and there are many bright minds here. We all know what the solutions are, what should be done to solve the problems. And somehow our politicians just can't get it right. They just... They keep screwing it up, you know, so don't ask the politicians to solve it. Give it to the scientists, give it to the farmers, give it to the engineers. They'll solve the problems for us. Ordinary people will. Politicians will do nothing. Transition will have to occur in simple steps that flow from one to the other. We can't go from zero to hero. We can't go from a moneyless driven capitalistic consumeristic monster to a moneyless society that lives in harmony and Zen, right? It's not going to happen. So. Uh, if you go onto my website, the UbuntuParty.org.za website, I've started posting a number of papers on how the transition will take place. There's no time for it now, so 
ask you, please go onto our website and check it out. It's beautiful. What's key here is that the small towns will probably play a very important part in the transformation. Because in small towns and small communities, people will agree on things a lot quicker than in the big cities. Right? So they will agree, okay, we need to get off the grid, we need to grow enough food for all of us, we need to make sure we got water, and they can go out and do it. We must create alternative energy for ourselves in our town, so if the grid goes down, we stay alive. And the small towns and villages will become the activators of this transitional phase. And I put together a few theories and ideas to give people ideas how to start doing this. It also goes into, into our education and schooling systems, where we stop, stop sending your children to school. Please, I beg you, don't send your children to school. Don't do it. You're turning them into monsters. <laughs> I've had now a few, few of my friends in Johannesburg, in South Africa, that have not sent their kids to school. They are much smarter than the kids that go to school. And I'm not kidding you. They really are. They just learn from their parents and they learn. And, and you'll find that, that what, often what happens with these kids, they start reading later. They might start reading a little bit later. But when they start reading, they become like these... They become like these monster little readers that just read everything. I mean, these little kids are reading books that you know, other kids don't even dream of and that's because they're not preconditioned by the schooling system <coughs> energy water food housing arts and recreation these are the things that small communities can take control of very very quickly and establish it for themselves make themselves go off the grid and be totally in control of their own destiny let's uh, take a few moments to calm the mind another ad uh... cozy up under the cover and many, many community projects must be and should be attached to this activity. Absolute abundance on all levels. Why don't you start doing this? Food, science, culture, community, abundance on all levels. Now, I'm going to give you a small example. You've got to use your imagination here because there's not enough time now. And we've got to finish off here. So <laughs> imagine in the little town that I live, we've got a river, we've got a fish farm, we've got a dairy farm, we've got a bakery, we've got a okay. wood, fa wood, wood farm. I'm doing this exercise now. I've watched this before, but I'm going to do this now. Factory, a metal factory. The community starts to work in these projects. The the whole Ubuntu thing means that, and contribution means that everybody must contribute three hours a week towards one of these community projects. That's all you have to do. Three hours a week. A little town of a thousand people. It's three thousand hours a week. No municipality or town council can afford three hours, three thousand hours a week salaries for people to do this work. Can you see how that's dramatically shifted the status quo and the equilibrium? How much we can produce if we just work for three hours a week on basic projects, producing milk, cheese, butter, fish, breeding fish, uh, baking bread, planting, growing vegetables, and so forth. So now the community has been doing this for six months or a year, and they've established abundance on all levels, where all the people in that community that participate, that's why I called it contributionism, that participate and add their t talent and their skills and their time, get everything, not for free, but virtually for free, so cheaply that the rest of the stuff, and also there's a principle where you, man where you, where you create three times as much as you need for your own community. And I structure everything in the, in the Ubuntu uh, philosophy on the sacred geometry principles, 3366. So you produce three times as much as you need for your community. Why? Because there'll be other communities that can't produce what you're doing, so you'll be actually helping them while they're helping you with the things that you can't produce. So, And by the end of that, there's so much abundance because you're doing it three times that Whatever you don't consume in your own little village or town, what are you going to do with? You're going to make it available on farmer's markets and stores in your town for the surrounding communities. The moment you've achieved that state, you've created the domino effect. Because what's going to happen to all the neighboring towns? All the people from those towns are going to come buy your bread, your milk, your cheese, your whatever it is you produce. Because it's going to be a fraction of the cost they pay for it in their own town. There's your domino effect. There's your trigger point. So... Think about it from that perspective. At the, at the outset, it sounds like a huge thing. Wow, how are we going to go from there to a moneyless society? I believe that I've just taken you through a very simplistic examples, example of how small towns and small villages and communities can be the trigger points and the examples that start the domino effect. Once the first town is set up, it's impossible for the surrounding towns to stay alive.
yeah. they will have to follow the same example. Otherwise, all their businesses will close down. And when they do close down, then they will follow your example. So either they will do it willingly or they'll be forced into it because of stupidity. <laughs> in, in the Ubuntu communities, children follow their passion and their dreams. The education system changes completely. There are no classrooms. Children learn real practical skills. So by the age of 16, they've done everything. They've baked the bread. They've, they've worked in nuclear laboratories. They've built rockets. They've built homes. They've created they've create earth, built earth ships. They've planted seedlings and grown fruit. And they'll be so wise by the time you're 16 because you've had all this experience. You'll be smarter than all the professors in the world thrown together today. <laughs> take, take any school lever today, put them on a farm, put them anywhere into a practical solution. What can a person with a high school diploma do today? Absolutely nothing. We're useless to society. That's what they've created. Can you see the brilliance in their plan? They are so smart, these people. They. <laughs> That's us, right? So we are so smart that we're doing this to ourselves, right? Where we create our children, turn our children into these little, we lock them up in jails for 12 years, most precious years of their life, and then throw them out to start all over again and, and be totally open to manipulation and control. So master teachers, only when a community decides that you're a master shoemaker or you're a master rocket scientist or you're a master baker or a master that only the community can decide who they will allow to teach their children. Isn't that a better system than teachers that go and get some diploma and they're real assholes and they teach your child? <laughs> you go, God, how can that? I'm going to let the teacher teach my child. The community will have the final say. So when I say decentralized government, that's how fine it becomes. The community chooses who their master teachers are, the people that they have respect for, and the people that they honor for their capacity and their ability. And this is how we grow, how we build Ubuntu communities, because only out of unity comes infinite diversity and abundance. Only out of unity. Anything else is a futile exercise that will bring us back to the same point at some future point in time. So I'm going to end here because this is the end. Join the Ubuntu Liberation Movement. It's not just a South African entity. We've had various people around the world say to us, can we start the same thing in, in wherever? Yes. Go online. Start the same thing. Use all the material I've published. Put it out there. Share it with everybody. And become part of this transitional phase. And uh, thank you for listening. I hope I gave you some food for thought. Yeah. Absolutely, that did give us some food for thought. That's a perfect, perfect example of how to live and still have everything that you want and need in a world free of money. I like that guy. He's a visionary. And I'll put a link that video in the description down below so you can watch it in your own time as for the third world countries that are suffering yeah it is up to us to just stand in I think we're just gonna have to demand that we get whoever just to print out that money at the mint and pay it back ourselves because there is no way that they're going to be able to do it they're like themselves and we are actually all they have really it is i still cannot believe it i still cannot believe that poverty is actually a thing I can't believe that apartheid is actually a thing. When the dinosaurs, okay, the dinosaurs were here before us. The world was just one big piece of land. When that meteorite hit Earth, it destroyed the dinosaurs, but it also destroyed the land and it broke up into 
different continents. So Africa just happens to be a hot country. So that's why people are dark skinned there. Because their skin has to protect them. Like, because the, they had to develop a dark, it's evolution. Their skin had to develop. <laughs> they had to develop a thicker skin to us, to white people. Like, my father's English. It's a very, very cold country. That's why he's white. Because there's not a lot of sun there. That's why Asian people have, um, I don't know how to say this without so sounding rude, because I don't mean to be rude, but the reason why their eyes are, like, slanted is because of the humidity there. It's just evolution. It's how, how, it's how our bodies have adjusted to the climate. So how the fuck, excuse me, how is it fair? that people are treated worse because they're darker skinned, it just doesn't make any fucking sense. Make it make sense! And, I mean, I'm experiencing it now in my own personal life, but I fully understand, I fully know what greed is about. And the need for power and control over other people. And it's, it's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. Our divine birthright is to be free. Not to live above or underneath another person. Like... Do I look fucking starved to anyone? I don't think so. Because white privilege. I mean, like, I don't have a lot. I get money from the... I, I get, only live off money from the government. I don't have a lot, but I get by. Why the fuck? Who... Who says that white people can have this, this, and this, but darker people can't have this, this, and this because of the color of their skin? Exactly. Make it make sense. Try and justify that. You can't. Yeah. And just with um, individuals that I know about, that, that I know about, that I deal with on a regular basis. So, uh, for example, I'm just going to use Andrea Cox from the Detox Intuitive channel when, you know, she said that she was involved in all that nasty shit. And she said... Because I was given an inheritance that I needed to be taught a life lesson, right? And then she stole from me. And then she has pictures of her Mercedes in her house that actually came from me. And even to, even yesterday, because it's after midnight now, when I went into the city, yeah, she was like involved in trying to get me shot dead because she wants to take my place or be me. Just really, really crazy stuff. So yes, that is an example of how greed just takes over people and the need for power. It's superficial. I don't have a lot, but I'm happy like as a clam. And actually, thank you, morons for cutting off my power and I had a freezing cold shower because now I know what people in third world countries actually how they live on a daily basis so you know the people that are on YouTube claiming to be the spiritual community but are actually like you know spreading plague and creating drama and problems and etc 
stop. I think collectively we should be focusing on what's important. For one, making third world countries like first world countries, getting them on the same level as us, that's what's most important. Getting the world out of a low vibrational state, that's what's important. I know that's exactly what I want to see within my lifetime here in this body. I'm not interested in this pathetic drama that people are trying to just start just over nothing. Just self-hatred, jealousy and greed. That's all it boils down to. I'm sure that later on when I'm in bed, that's when I do most of my overthinking anyway, I'll be able to come up with some more ideas how to help Africa. Well, actually, it's not just Africa. Like, there are, there are Middle Eastern countries, are third world countries too. And they're, they're all important. We were all made equal. You know, God lowered the kingdom of heaven to earth. We should be experiencing heaven on earth, not a living hell on earth. Because it is. You know that song by Alice Cooper? It's such a brutal planet. It's such a living hell. Exactly. It is a living hell. So when I come up with some more ideas, if I do, no doubt I'll be on here making another video about it and sharing my sharing my thoughts. Uh, but yeah, this is number one first world problem and needs to be fixed. I don't care how, it needs to be fixed. It's, it cannot go on. It needs to end. Just a little, little compassion, uh, a little compassion and kindness does actually go a long way. If people treat each other with love and kindness and compassion, there wouldn't be this shit. There wouldn't be poverty. There wouldn't be wars. It wouldn't be a living hell. So I think collectively, we need to start moving forward now as soon as possible. That's all I have to say for for tonight. I'm under a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. I'm going through a lot of shit myself. Um, but as I said, this is just, this is all I can think of for now is how we're going to, yeah, Africa can't do it for themselves. They are fucked. I know some African people and they are absolutely lovely. I'm sure that if I asked them for help, they would help me with whatever I needed like that. I think it's because like, because of what they've been through, they know what it's like, you know? So I guess they like to help it. I guess they like to help out as much as they can. So it's, We need to correct what was done to them. That's one way we can raise the vibration of the planet. Until next time, I bid you good, good evening, sweet dreams. And for fuck's sake, for fuck's sake, treat each other with kindness. Treat yourselves with kindness. It goes a long way. Good night.